see your registration, proof of insurance, <laughs> and ID. Can I get in my thing? Yep, go ahead. All I want to do is I make sure you will. I you understand that, okay. but. Welcome back to U.S. Corrupt Cops, where we expose shocking incidents of law enforcement misconduct caught on camera. In today's video, we're diving into a disturbing case where officers attempt to cover up an illegal stop. And yes, it was all caught on dash cam. The truth, hidden in plain sight, unfolds before your eyes. If you like this video, press 1. On June 4th, 2021, an unidentified individual, whom we'll call Mr. Bill, was sitting in his car in a residential neighborhood in East Tennessee, playing a GPS-based game. A cop named Corporal Gallo from the Blount County Sheriff's Department approached Mr. Bill's vehicle and began questioning him about his activities. Mr. Bill informed the cop that he was playing a game and requested that he turn on his body camera to document their interaction. When the cop replied that he had left his body cam at the office, Mr. Bill decided to record the incident himself. You? Okay. You do that if you want to. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> We've had thefts in the community, okay? And you don't live here. Do you have a reasonable not, suspicion? The reasonable suspicion is that the possibility that you could be a thief in this area. I have explained to you what I'm doing. I want to know who I'm dealing with. You could be an axe murderer. Okay. So you, could, you. could you? Yeah. No, not in my uniform. Yes, I'm you at could. Work. No. no, no, no. There have been plenty of cases where officers have broken the law. Okay. Let's not pretend. Nobody not, is perfect. I'm not breaking the law. I'm asking you for your ID, so you can show me your identity, and I can walk away from here and give you your your uh, identification right back to you, and we'll be done. Are you issuing me a not right civil this citation? Second. No, not the second. Am I being detained? Or am I free to go? You're not being detained. You can leave if you want to, yes. Okay, thank you. But if I'm free to go, I'm free to stay. No, you're not. The cop tells Mr. Bill that he is free to go, implying he is not being detained, but also not allowed to stay, effectively ordering Mr. Bill to leave the area. However, cops cannot constitutionally force individuals to leave a public place in most situations. In the 1999 Supreme Court case of Chicago v. Morales, it was held that a Chicago ordinance prohibiting criminal street gang members from loitering in any public place violated the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment because, among other reasons, it provides absolute discretion to police officers to decide what activities constitute loitering. In reaching this conclusion, a plurality of the court also recognized that the freedom to loiter for innocent purposes is part of the liberty protected by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. We have expressly identified this right to remove from one place to another according to inclination as an attribute of personal liberty protected by the Constitution. Indeed, it is evident that an individual's decision to remain in a public place of his choice is as much a part of his liberty as the freedom of movement within our borders or the right to move to any place one's own inclination may direct. There are instances where cops can order citizens to leave or disperse from public property. For example, Section 39-17-305 of the Tennessee Code states that a person commits an offense who, in a public place and with intent to cause public annoyance or alarm, refuses to obey an official order to disperse issued to maintain public safety in dangerous proximity to a fire, hazard, or other emergency, and Section 39-17-307 criminalizes intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly disobeying a reasonable request or order to move issued by a person known to be a law enforcement officer, a firefighter, or someone with authority to control the use of the premises to prevent obstruction of a highway or passageway, or maintain public safety by dispersing those gathered in dangerous proximity to a fire, riot, or other hazard. However, in this situation, the cop seems to order Mr. Bill to leave simply because he doesn't want him there, which a court would almost certainly find to be a violation of the 14th Amendment. These constitutional protections are in place to prevent abuses of power by corrupt cops who might otherwise infringe upon individual liberties. 
is this a is this a public street? You're, you're suspicious in this area. Okay, I, I don't you know have, if you're getting ready to go have, to this lady's house and steal anything. You have approached or this lady's me. House or anything. You have okay? approached me. Do you want to leave? You have you approached got one or two me. Options. You can leave. You have approached me, and I have explained what I am doing. I am playing a game on my phone. So That's you think just I'm your a liar? Excuse. So I'm a liar then. Let you're, me tell you, you, let you're, me tell you this, okay? You you're saying I deal with ninety percent of the worst people, 90% of the time, 10% worse people, okay? Yes, yeah, I understand. Your sense of trust has gone completely. No, it's not there. But just, I'm asking you to, to obey the law. I'm, I'm asking you to obey the law. I am obeying the law. No, you are not. You do no. not have a reasonable, articulable have, yes, suspicion. I do. Yes, I do. What is you your reasonable, in, articulable suspicion that I am about in, to commit, in, uh, have committed, or will commit a crime? You are in an area. What is your you reasonable, inhabit, articulable suspicion okay? that I have committed, will you, commit, you or about to commit a crime? No, sir, I'm not. Stay there. Now you're in violation of traffic law on top of being in a neighborhood where you don't live. You which, live on Ridge Street, right? Which traffic law am I in violation of, sir? You're in violation of registration right now. How so? Because this is on a white minivan and the tag comes back to a green car. Well, I can't. That's what we were issued. But if I'm in violation, please issue me a citation. Let me see your registration, proof of insurance, <clears throat> and ID. Can I get in my thing? Yep, go ahead. I'll always give you that make sure you will I understand that, okay. but what does my ID have to do with making sure the area is safe? Okay. Is the area any more safer now that you've identified me? Yes, and I'm going to tell you how. Okay. The, uh, the explanation that I'm fixing to give you is the reason why I do what I do. Okay, this area, now that I have your ID, the area, if something does happen, something could happen, there's a possibility of an already known suspect now that was in the area prior to anything happening. So if something happens tonight or the next day or something like that, who's the strange people in the area? That would be you, okay? Cop Gallo tells Mr. Bill that he wanted to identify him as a potential suspect in case any criminal activity occurred in the next few days. While it's legal to sit in your car parked in a lawful spot in a neighborhood where you don't live, under certain circumstances, it might be considered suspicious by cops. In the 2007 case of U.S. v. Wilson, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals held that, because there is nothing about being seated in a car which is itself suspicious, the fact that a person is seated in a vehicle does not create a different test. Instead, it is simply a relevant consideration under the totality of the circumstances it in no way changes the overarching constitutional analysis. The fundamental inquiry in determining whether evidence is admissible is whether, in light of the totality of the circumstances surrounding the seizure, it was reasonable for law enforcement personnel to proceed as they did. However, Cop Gallo's assertion that he needed to ID Mr. Bill based on the possibility of a future crime doesn't seem to fit within the Terry Stop framework which allows cops to detain an individual on reasonable suspicion that the individual is involved in criminal activity or that criminal activity may be afoot. Scouting a home for a later break-in would be considered criminal activity, but there's no objective evidence that Mr. Bill was doing this. In the 1979 case of Brown v. Texas, the Supreme Court held that applying a Texas Stop and ID statute when cops didn't have reasonable suspicion of a crime, was unconstitutional, stating that the Texas statute under which appellant was stopped and required to identify himself is designed to advance a weighty social objective in large metropolitan centers, prevention of crime. But even assuming that purpose is served to some degree by stopping and demanding identification from an individual without any specific basis for believing he is involved in criminal activity, the guarantees of the Fourth Amendment do not allow it. When such a stop is not based on objective criteria, the risk of arbitrary and abusive police practices exceeds tolerable limits. Applying this standard, a court would likely find that Cop Gallo lacked sufficient evidence to reasonably suspect that Mr. Bill was engaging in criminal activity, especially after Mr. Bill explained he was just playing a GPS game. Come and talk to you. We'll, commit a, well, we'll that's do fine. An Why don't you come and talk to me when you have suspicion of an actual crime? Sir, Sitting if, on the side of the can, road is not 
suspicion of a crime. Yes, this is, is a this is a road. What crime is suspe is sitting on do a you public know anybody road? Anybody in this subdivision? As a matter of fact, I do. Okay. Why aren't you sitting in front of their house? Because I already sat in front of their house. I explained to you this is a GPS game. You understand GPS, I know. I understand GPS, and I understand people doing all these games. But if you want to be hard with me as far as... I'm not trying to be hard. Things, I'm trying... To I want you to obey the law. I am doing the law. No, that you are... You, as, as a corporal... Is my duty. Bull. As a what? corporal, you I'm glad be, you know my job better than I do. I don't know your job better than you, you do, on, but I do know on. the okay. statute for identify. The I was statute. not committing you a know what? The statute for identifying yourself is anybody over the age of 18 has to have a document in their possession of who they are at all times. But I don't have to give it to you. When you are asked and requested Bull. by a by a officer you, you unless you are issuing me a civil no, or a I criminal citation anything then this is I Nazi Germany your, I can ask for your identification at and any you given time. sure you can ask for it but I'm not legally required to give it to you Corporal Gallo and Mr. Bill engage in a debate over when individuals are obligated to provide identification to a cop Mr. Bill asserts that he only needs to show ID if he's being issued a citation or civil warrant while Corporal Gallo contends that everyone over 18 must carry ID documents and present them upon a cop's demand. Mr. Bill references Section 7-3-505 of the Tennessee Code, which states, When any police or peace officer of a metropolitan government asks the violator for identification for the purpose of issuing a citation or civil warrant to that person, the failure to produce or give such identification shall be grounds for the violator to be arrested. However, Section 55-50-351 of the Code also specifies that every licensee shall have the licensee's license in immediate possession at all times when operating a motor vehicle and shall display it upon demand of any officer or agent of the department or any police officer of the state, county, or municipality. It's important to note that cops can always request an individual's identification consensually without violating the Constitution, but can only compel someone to provide ID under certain conditions. For example, in the 2000 case of State v. Daniel, the Tennessee Supreme Court explained, courts have consistently held that the Fourth Amendment is not implicated and no seizure occurs when police approach an individual in a public place or in a parked car, ask questions, and request a search, so long as police do not convey a message that compliance with their requests is required. Nonetheless, under Tennessee law, operating a motor vehicle isn't limited to driving it, as Section 55-50-102-43 defines an operator as any person who drives or is in actual physical control of a motor vehicle upon a highway. Therefore, the Supreme Court noted in the 1993 case of State v. Pulley, a police officer may approach a car parked in a public place and ask for driver identification and proof of vehicle registration without any reasonable suspicion of illegal activity. While the court would likely find that Mr. Bill needed to present his driver's license to Corporal Gallo upon request because he was in actual physical control of a motor vehicle, Corporal Gallo's claim that every adult in Tennessee must carry ID documents and present them upon a cop's request is entirely unfounded. While drivers do need to carry a license when operating a vehicle, there's no general law requiring citizens to carry identification at all times. Additionally, outside the context of operating a motor vehicle, Tennessee law only allows cops to demand identification when issuing a citation or civil warrant and cops in any state can only constitutionally order individuals to identify themselves if they have a reasonable suspicion that the person is involved in criminal activity. I'm happy you feel that way. Have a good afternoon, sir. Thank you. You Please too. move on. If I'm free to go, I'm free to stay. I'm going to ask you. Leave are you area, asking? Please. Are you asking me or ordering me? I'm asking you to leave there. Are you asking me or ordering me? I'm asking you to leave there. If you are ordering me, I will leave. If you are asking me, I would stay. If I'd like to stay. To order you, I'm ordering you to leave there. Thank you very much. I will certainly leave. Following the cop's order to leave, Mr. Bill complied and drove away. Later that day, he uploaded footage of the incident to his YouTube channel, 
mentioning that he plans to follow up with the Office of Professional Standards. It's uncertain whether Mr. Bill will pursue any legal action regarding the encounter. Overall, the cop receives an F for demonstrating a fundamental misunderstanding of reasonable suspicion, blatantly misinterpreting his state's identification laws, and forcing Mr. Bill to vacate a place where he had every right to be. Like many officers, he based his assertion of reasonable suspicion on claims that don't align with the court's modern interpretation. While an unfamiliar presence in an area might seem somewhat suspicious and could warrant observation by law enforcement, such behavior rarely justifies detaining and identifying a citizen. If the cop was genuinely concerned that Mr. Bill posed a threat to the community, observing him from a distance would likely have provided enough information to conclude he wasn't engaged in criminal activity. Simply being present in a public space isn't indicative of criminal behavior nor is it connected to a location's past or future crimes. The cop's claim that Mr. Bill could be linked to past or future crimes in the area was both factually incorrect and legally unfounded, turning what could have been a positive interaction with a member of the public into an unwarranted detention and forced identification. Mr. Bill earns an a for challenging the cop's assertions without becoming overly aggressive, maintaining a calm and composed demeanor throughout the interaction, and peacefully complying with the cop's lawful orders. He was entirely within his rights to park his vehicle on a public street and play games without disturbance, and he initially provided a legitimate explanation of his actions without compromising his rights. It wasn't until the cop mentioned the registration violation that Mr. Bill agreed to present his identification, at which point he was legally obligated to do so. Mr. Bill did an excellent job balancing his civil liberties with the lawful demands of the cops, demonstrating a thorough understanding of the First, Fourth, and Fourteenth Amendments. As he noted in his original upload, he doesn't claim to be a First Amendment auditor, which makes his assertive yet respectful dialogue all the more impressive. I commend Mr. Bill for staying calm under pressure and setting himself up for a strong case later in court. Next, on July 20th, 2022, an auditor from Clear Lake Community Watch, whom we'll refer to as Mr. Clear Lake, drove past Deputy C. Vega of the Harris County Sheriff's Office while he was conducting a traffic stop in Seabrook, Texas. As he passed, Mr. Clear Lake rolled down his window and shouted an anti-cop remark, including a profanity, at Deputy Vega. Deputy Vega abandoned the traffic stop, got into his vehicle, made a U-turn and began following Mr. Clear Lake. After properly signaling, Mr. Clear Lake made a right turn, prompting Deputy Vega to activate his lights to pull him over. Mr. Clear Lake immediately pulled into a gas station and stopped his vehicle. Why do you pull me over? I'll tell you that if you roll it down. Why can't you tell me now? Because the reason I pulled you over is you're yelling something from your car. So what? Huh? So what? That's okay. why you pulled me over? Because I'm because yelling? I don't know if you need help or anything. Oh, I don't need help. So, Thank you. Okay, let me see your driver's license real quick. I don't need help. Deputy Vega claims he pulled over Mr. Clear Lake because he yelled out the window, asserting concern for Mr. Clear Lake's well-being rather than being offended by his words. The First Amendment prohibits government officials from taking retaliatory actions against individuals in response to their protected speech. In the 2006 Supreme Court case Hartman v. Moore, the court stated, Official reprisal for protected speech offends the Constitution because it threatens to inhibit exercise of the protected right, and the law is settled that, as a general matter, the First Amendment prohibits government officials from subjecting an individual to retaliatory actions including criminal prosecutions, for speaking out. As the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which has jurisdiction over Texas, explained in the 2002 case Keenan v. Tejeda, to establish a First Amendment retaliation claim, a plaintiff must show that they were engaged in constitutionally protected activity. The defendant's actions caused them to suffer an injury that would chill a person of ordinary firmness from continuing to engage in that activity. 
and the defendant's adverse actions were substantially motivated against the plaintiff's exercise of constitutionally protected conduct. In this case, it's nearly indisputable that Mr. Clear Lake was engaged in protected activity, as the Supreme Court has long held that profanity is protected speech under the First Amendment, and Deputy Vega admitted he pulled over Mr. Clear Lake because he yelled out the window. However, it's less clear whether a court would determine that being subjected to a traffic stop resulting in a warning, with no citation or arrest, would constitute an injury that would chill a person of ordinary firmness from continuing to engage in that activity. In the Keenan case, the Fifth Circuit held that this element was satisfied by two traffic stops involving an undercurrent of violence that resulted in a minor citation and a criminal charge. However, the court also recognized that some retaliatory actions, even if they actually have the effect of chilling the plaintiff's speech, are too trivial or minor to be actionable as a violation of the First Amendment. For instance, in the 2009 case Benson v. McKinney, the U.S. District Court in the Western District of Louisiana, which is part of the Fifth Circuit, held that a traffic stop resulting in a citation for which there was probable cause was not a sufficient injury for a First Amendment retaliation claim when the plaintiff did not allege that the cop threatened him or that the traffic stop was otherwise carried out in an intimidating manner. Based on this decision, the Western District of Louisiana noted in the 2012 case, Simmons v. City of Mamou, that not all instances of detention by police would chill a person of ordinary firmness from continuing to engage in protected activity. Therefore, it's possible that a court could conclude that Mr. Clear Lake cannot pursue a First Amendment retaliation claim, even though it's evident that Deputy Vega initiated the traffic stop for a retaliatory purpose. However, it's much more likely that Mr. Clear Lake could succeed in a claim that Deputy Vega violated his Fourth Amendment rights by initiating a traffic stop without reasonable suspicion or probable cause. That's your driver's license? What for? Can you use the turn signal when you make turn? Of course I did. Your license. You can hear the sound on the dash cam too. Let me see, let me see your driver's license. You can just crack the window if that's what you want to do. It's already cracked. I can't see that. Well, it doesn't matter. Here. I don't wish to answer questions. You have to let me know if there's a weapon in the car. Did you not take the class? I did. Did they tell you you have to tell them? When you demand identification, I have to display this. That's what they told me in the class, that's what the law says. The officer wants to take away... And actually, if I don't display, there's really not much you can do because there is no penalty attached to that. I have to carry this if I'm carrying this. Are you carrying? I don't answer questions. Okay, so if you have a weapon in the car, then what? You got one on your hip. When the cop, Deputy Vega, asked for his identification, Mr. Clear Lake, who had a holstered firearm on his right hip, presented his driver's license and his license to carry, but refused to answer the cop's questions about whether he had a handgun in the car. According to Section 46.02 of the Texas Penal Code, a person commits an offense if the person intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly carries on or about his or her person a handgun in a motor vehicle that is owned by the person or under the person's control at any time in which the handgun is in plain view, unless the person is 21 years of age or older, or is licensed to carry a handgun, and the handgun is carried in a holster. As of September 1, 2021, Texans who are not disqualified from carrying a handgun in public places can do so without a license to carry, LTC. However, individuals who possess a handgun license are subject to additional requirements during interactions with cops. Under Section 4, 11.205 of the Texas Government Code, if a license holder is carrying a handgun on or about the license holder's person, when a peace officer demands that the license holder display identification, the license holder shall display both the license holder's driver's license and the license holder's handgun license. The statute does not require the LTC holder to verbally confirm if they are carrying a firearm, 
or provide any further information, which helps safeguard citizens' rights and prevent potential overreach by corrupt cops. By showing both his driver's license and his LTC when the cop requested his ID, Mr. Clear Lake fully complied with the law and was not obligated to answer any additional questions from the cop about whether there was a handgun in the car. Do I smell alcohol in your breath? No, you don't. How do I know? Because you can't smell my breath? I can smell something coming Oh, out. really? Let's see. Let me do some field sobriety. I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, where are you coming from? Huh? Where are you coming from? You saw me where I was coming oh, from. I saw you driving down. Are you done with this? I'm done with that, yeah. All right, cool. Where are you coming from? I don't answer questions. I've already told you. Let me know when I'm free to go. Also, what is your name? Your name? Sheriff, that's your name? Sheriff? I, I, I'm not familiar with the Eng English alphabet, sir. Okay, can I, have a, can I have an incident number, please? Oh, a ticket, a ticket. Okay. When Mr. Clear Lake asks the cop for his name, Deputy Vega refuses to provide it. Instead, he points to the name badge on his uniform and tells Mr. Clear Lake it will be on the ticket after making a snide remark about his English abilities. Policy 302 of the Harris County Sheriff's Department Handbook, which outlines the department's requirements for professional conduct by cops and other HCSO employees, establishes a duty to provide official identification. The policy states, all employees shall present their HCSO identification card when requested by a member of the public when engaged in law enforcement activities or when in uniform. Although Mr. Clear Lake did not request the corrupt cop's identification card, he did ask for his name, and Vega's rude and mocking response certainly didn't align with the spirit of this policy. However, it's worth noting that citizens generally cannot seek legal recourse for even blatant violations of police department policies unless the cop's actions also constitute a violation of statutory or constitutional law. Okay, well, while I have you here, okay, I don't want you exiting the vehicle because you have a weapon in the car. Did or I I'm exit, going the, to, I'm going to did I exit the vehicle? I'm, I'm, I'm did I exit the vehicle? Give your heads up. Did I exit the vehicle? Hey, can I? You do have a dash cam, right? Very good. You can't just pull me over because I said the police. I hope you realize that, stupid I'm sorry? Do you have insurance on the vehicle? Yeah. Can you show it to me please? It doesn't come back. Of course it comes back. Not on my system, it doesn't. Also, it's not typical behavior for somebody to be yelling out of the vehicle. Have you had anything to drink tonight? Is that your current address? 1622? Is that a question? Yes, sir. Is that your current do address? I, do I answer questions? Okay, I'll just assume that's incorrect then. And why would you do that? Did you read my address on the driver license? It didn't have an, address, didn't that, have an apartment number on your driver Of course license. it does. Let me see, can you verify? You have already seen it. I've already complied with that part. I know. Okay, I'll be right back. May yeah, I say that I've never met anybody quite like you that would uh, yell at an officer doing their job, but so you have a great let me understand. No fines, no penalties, Wait, may I ask you a question? Uh, this question's on there. There's the uh, address. Yeah, no, I have a question. Can you get your supervisor right here, please? No, uh, is the stop over? The stop is over. You may leave. All right. You don't exit until I get out. Until I leave. Well, uh, you said the stop is over, right? Okay, I'm not. I'm not getting out. I will. Okay, there is no need to draw your weapon, man. Are you drawing your weapon? You I didn't get out of the car. You told me that already. Yeah. Did I get out of the car? Go f yourself. Yeah, right over there you came. After Deputy Vega informs Mr. Clear Lake that the traffic stop is over, he orders him to stay in his vehicle. Mr. Clear Lake opens his car door but doesn't attempt to exit, and in response, the cop draws his weapon. According to Policy 505 of the Harris County Sheriff's Department Handbook on the Use and Discharge of Firearms, the deputy's unsnapping of the holster and placing a hand on the service weapon is permitted when approaching a possibly dangerous situation. And, firearms may be removed from the holster and readied for use in situations where it is anticipated they may be required. However, the policy also states Firearms shall not be displayed or pointed in a threatening or intimidating fashion unless it is objectively reasonable to believe deadly force is justified or there is a substantial risk 
that the situation may escalate to the point where deadly force would be justified. Firearms shall be secured and returned to their holsters as soon as practical when it is determined that deadly force will not be necessary. Another section of the policy requires cops to exhaust all reasonable means of apprehension and control before resorting to the use of a firearm. Here, the footage doesn't show whether the cop simply held his weapon or if he displayed or pointed it in a threatening or intimidating manner. But it's clear from Mr. Clear Lake's reaction that he felt threatened. It's possible that the corrupt cop was acting within the authority granted by this policy by removing the firearm from the holster when Mr. Clear Lake opened the car door because he seemed to anticipate that Mr. Clear Lake might exit the vehicle with the firearm he was carrying. However, it's much more challenging to justify an intimidating display of the weapon, as it doesn't seem it would have been objectively reasonable for the cop to believe that deadly force was justified, or even that there was a substantial risk that the situation might escalate to that point when Mr. Clear Lake simply opened his car door. A warning? A warning? For what? Fail to signal return indicator within 100 feet. Weapon on me. He drew the gun. Following the traffic stop, Mr. Clear Lake submitted a public records request to the Harris County Sheriff's Office for footage from Deputy Vega's body camera and dash cam, along with additional information about Deputy Vega. The department responded by claiming his request was vague and or overly broad and mistakenly sent a clarification request to the wrong email address. Unaware of this miscommunication, Mr. Clear Lake only discovered the issue when he visited the department in person to obtain the documents. As of this writing, Mr. Clear Lake has not indicated that he has received any materials from his public records request. He has also expressed his intent to file a complaint and a lawsuit. Overall, Deputy Vega receives an F for retaliating against Mr. Clear Lake for exercising his First Amendment rights, initiating a traffic stop without reasonable suspicion, and unnecessarily brandishing his firearm. It's evident throughout the encounter that the cop was angry with Mr. Clear Lake for the comment he shouted from his window, mentioning his speech multiple times during the interaction. Throughout the exchange, Deputy Vega seems to be searching for any excuse to take further action against Mr. Clear Lake, embarking on several fishing expeditions in an obvious attempt to obtain reasonable suspicion to search the vehicle or find another justification to detain or arrest him. This traffic stop highlights why it's essential for cops to respect the First Amendment and avoid letting their egos influence their decision-making. Mr. Clear Lake earns an A for refusing to answer any of the cops' questions, complying with the law while declining to provide more information than necessary, and taking appropriate action after the traffic stop. Although he used assertive language toward the corrupt cop, he was entirely within his First Amendment rights. Throughout the interaction, Mr. Clear Lake demonstrated that he was well versed in both his constitutional rights and his legal obligations as an LTC holder. I commend Mr. Clear Lake for filing a public records request, following through when the records were not provided, and pursuing a complaint and a lawsuit against the corrupt cop. Thanks for watching, US Corrupt Cops. Remember, your support helps us bring these stories to light. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for more eye-opening content on police misconduct. Share this video if you believe in accountability and justice. See you in the next one.